Hi everyone, Raptor here. Today I want to talk about the new Yavada release format that has been popping up lately in Popper. This is a net that I have been working on for quite some time, along with Halley Highs, also known as Sight and Writing, on Match Online. I want to talk about the thought process and all the effort that went into building this net, because looking at the final product, it's really, really powerful, but it wasn't always like that, and I think showing the history and the thought process that went into it is going to be pretty interesting because there's a lot to take away from it and there's a lot of lessons that can be learned when building combo nets and popper and so i wanted to try and talk about those lessons and me illustrate them on them because i haven't really seen anyone talk about these in a way that is compact so i wanted to try and make a video talking about these concepts and ideas First, I want to give a quick overview of the different ideas that I'm already been talking about. The first one here is, when working on any debt, you should try to work with other people if you can. The benefit of working with people is that they're going to see things that you would not have seen otherwise. And by working with other people, you get to have them work around, and you're going to be more efficient in the long run. Additionally, you get new perspectives, and I don't think that's ever a bad thing, because when it comes to net building, you're rarely going to have all the ideas, and not to mention, magic is a game with tons and tons of cards. You're not going to have experiences with all of them. The more eyes you have on, on a net, and the more people you're able to kind of talk to, the more likely you are to kind of find the missing pieces that an archetype might need. I would also like to give a quick shout out to Brian Cook. He's worked on this net as well and he, he has offered a number of interesting ideas when it comes to net building that I have not thought of before. So he has helped me a lot in terms of getting a new perspective when it comes to net building. And uh, yeah, just want to give a shout out to him as well. So the topics I want to talk about here when it comes to net building and popper, specifically for combinets, are first, get your hands dirty, think about consistency, how resilient is it yet, how compact is the combo, and how many bricks do you have? So, without further ado, let's hop into it. So, the first thing I want to talk about is getting your hands dirty. When Shadow Storm was banned in Popper, Kali Hyas and I both felt that Yelvonic Relay should have been banned as well, because it was a card that is very breakable, and it's only a matter of time before something else comes along and breaks it. So, we felt like, you know, instead of just prophesizing that Yelvonic Relay is broken, we should actually break it ourselves. And I think we ended up doing that, and that's pretty awesome. In order to do that, you gotta get your hands dirty. Try out different ideas. Even if you think they're stupid, try it out anyways. The reason why I say this is because you might not get something from an idea individually, but by trying out multiple different ideas, you might take something from both of them that gets you a new idea that actually works. Additionally, another thing that I would highly recommend is take breaks. What I mean by this is when you're working on something, you might get stuck. You might try out all these ideas and say, hmm, none of these really work. And you kind of get tunnel vision when you can't think of a new idea. But taking a break, it allows for you to, one, clear your head, but also work on new ideas, work on other archetypes, other nets, wait for new cards to come out. It gives you time to kind of come back with a fresh head and a new perspective, and you might have seen something you would not have seen otherwise. Additionally, the other thing that's really nice about this is, it doesn't mean you're giving up. I do this all the time, where I'll work on a net, and I'll get stuck, I don't have any ideas for how to make it better, and I put it on the back burner. I'll come back to it later, when I have a new idea, and I really enjoy this process, it's a very iterative process, but I would say this is the best way I can describe my approach when, when it comes to getting my hands dirty, is, you know, try things out, talk to people, mess around, and have fun. I think that is a really good way at being successful, when it comes to net building and popper. So, in order to show the iterative process, I want to show one of the first builds that we worked on. So, this one here was worked on primarily by Halley Guys in October. The idea behind this build was you play the hard Marauding Light Priest along with Weather the Storm. The problem with this build was that Weather was not really good on its own, nor was the Light Priest. Unlike Shatter Storm and First Day of Class, they couldn't really replace themselves or be okay on their own. It, got kind of awkward where you needed both of them to come together, and sometimes that just never happened. It just, unfortunately, while it's not like a bad build by any means, it's definitely less powerful than the current iterations. So, this was one of the builds that I worked on in November. The idea behind this was, instead of playing Shatter Storm, I can kind of make my own Shatter Storm. What I do is I play my first day of class, and then I copy it with teach my example. So I effectively have 8 copies of first day of class, and the idea behind this is that 
you, when you play first day of class, you get pest summoning from the sideboard, and when you happy it, happy it, get another happy it pest summoning. And so once you get all three pest summonings, what you can do is you can play pest summoning and happy it with teacher by example to make even more tokens, and that's kind of like your, you know, make your own kind of storm, so to speak. There were a couple of problems with this build, and we'll talk about it later on, but the general gist of it was that uh, it was not very resilient, it was not very compact, and there were definitely bricks. So there were some, def some definite issues with these builds, and while it was a failure, we still learned things along the way, and uh, we were able to kind of take those ideas and try them elsewhere. So this is another build, I believe we, we built this on December 1st, uh, Halley Guys was trying this one out. The idea here was that we saw that the first day of class build was not very compact, it took up a lot of slots in our deck, and we wanted to try and find more room for hard draw spells. So the idea here was we would play Hermit Sword and things of that nature. The problem with this was that, one, it was not very resilient. Uh, your opponent played cards like Weather the Storm, you couldn't really kill them anymore, which was kind of problematic. Also, cards like Inner Fire were kind of bricks because if you were not playing it on the hammer turn, it didn't really do anything. In fact, sometimes it lost you mana. It didn't really work out in the end, but it was still worth trying. And then lastly, we have right here, the very first build of uh, Painter Storm in Popper. This was built on December 20th, and I want to kind of address a couple things. So first, if you look at the deck name, it's Mottworks. I took this from an old Mottworks build that I was working on at the time. What that build was doing was it was playing the Mottworks combo in a Galvanic Relay shell. That was not very successful at breaking the Galvanic Relay because it was too clunky, it put up too many slots, it just didn't work. And at the time, I was working on Burn in Popper. I was having a really fun time with Burn. You yeah, got the new Heslet Flame Breather. That combined with Reckless Impulse was really sweet in Burn. Playing eight painters, and I thought to myself, what if I take this and I put it in a Yavonic Relay shell? I've been having such a fun time with Burn. I'm playing Reckless Impulse. I'm playing all these painters. I kind of feel like I'm kind of going off when I have a guy in play. Why don't we try this in Storm? And this was the very first build. You can see that it was not very good, and there's a number of problems with it that we can talk about, but we gotta start somewhere. And I think this was kind of the first build where we thought, let's try it painters out, let's see where it goes, and uh, yeah, this was kind of where it took off. We kept iterating over and over and over again, and uh, I'm not sure we got where we are today, so let's look at that. So here we are today, this is sort of what the present build looks like. And you can see that when we're not playing eight painters anymore, uh, we found that Eight was too many, sometimes you, you would just draw like a ton of painters and you couldn't really storm off anymore. And then you would kind of like this weird burn net, and we kind of had to find the happy medium of having enough painters so that we wouldn't just die to a single removal spell, but also not having too many that we were too clunky, right? We got so many new additions to Popper since then. We got, you know, the new Synthesizer, which is just amazing. You know, Deadly Dispute, Reckless Impulse. I mean, so many cards have been added to Popper since Shatterstorm was banned. And it was kind of the perfect storm, no pun intended, to kind of build this deck. And a lot of thought went into it, and I think this is a really good build. I think, you know, at this point, I would say the storm builds are going to differ slightly. Uh, there's going to be minor, you know, differences between them. Just like in the kind of storm era, they were like, you know, probably 90% similar, but the, the last 10% was where the differences were. But I think the storm is kind of at that home stretch now where we're pretty happy with where the build is. And uh, I definitely think this is a really good spot for it. And it's really, really awesome to kind of see the start to finish. I kind of want to look at the timeline real quick because I think it's it's really interesting and it offers a cool perspective. So this is actually the timeline here. And I think there's a lot of cool things to look at. On September 8th, kind of storm was banned. Before that, we actually got the Elite Dispute, but it was kind of overshadowed by how unhealthy the many game was that a lot of people were not really looking at Popper uh, or playing Popper, but uh, yeah, Deadly Spear was a heck of a card. On November 11th, we got Flame Breather, we got Reckless Impulse, and then on the 20th, we, we had the first build. Since then, we just kept iterating and kept working on it, and in the end, Dynasty, we got Experimental Synthesizer. It, and it's really kind of interesting, if you think about it, that you could have built this net right after Chandler was banned. It would not have been as good because you would not have had Experimental Synthesizer, you would have not have had uh, Reckless Impulse. However, we were building the Storm builds before those cards were even added. I believe our first builds on Storm didn't even have Reckless Impulse. It just wasn't obvious at the time. There was so much going on. It's really cool to kind of see how there's a combination of hard work and just being fortunate that we got all this amazing hard draw and popper. Uh, you know, I, I made a video a while back talking about how when I first built Shatterstorm, 
I wanted to play cards like Brainstorm and Ponder and Preordain because the card selection and, and, and all that was really, really critical. But now you look at Popper and Red and Black have probably the best card on the format. It's really, really funny. Now we have the Rat Nose build and never looking back. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So now that we've kind of talked about the history of this deck, I want to talk about some of the ideas that I kind of keep in mind when building any hammer and popper. So the first thing I want to talk about here is consistency. So let's kind of dive into that. The first thing that you kind of want to keep in mind when building any deck is how consistent are you? So there's a couple things that I want to talk about. So first off, what does it mean to be consistent? So what I kind of view it as is how frequently do you go off or fail? How fast are you? What what turns are you actually going off? Is, are you going off really early on turns two or turns three? Or are you going off later than that, right? Five or six. Additionally, you have this other idea of highs and lows. What I mean by that is are you going off really, really early? So like let's say for example, you can go off like on turn two or turn three, but if you don't, you know, your net kind of fails and it kind of just can't really do anything after that. Or are you instead trying to be a little bit slower, but you have these less explosive draws, but you're taking the median where you're more consistent at the expense of being less explosive. When we were building the various formats, that was something we definitely had to grapple with, is we want it to be fast, but at the same time, if that came at the cost of being consistent, we would rather take the median of just being a little bit slower, but being more consistent. And the recent builds of Storm, especially with all the new cards, it kind of gets both. It can heal very quickly. I heal people on turn two. You can also heal on turn three. That's probably more feasible than the turn two. On average, you're healing like turn four and turn five. Which, for proper standards, I would say is definitely good enough. One thing I also want to bring up here real quick is if you are a combo net, you also have to consider that you might be able to, to do multiple roles. So a really good example is Splinter Twin. It's hand combo, right, you can't go uh, Pest for Might, Splinter Queen, but also you can play a fair game with like Snap, Pest for Might, Lightning Malt, Hurt Command, you know, all that. So it didn't have to be consistent because it had a backdoor plan. The other topic that I want to talk about here is resiliency. So how resilient is your depth to your pieces of interaction? There's a couple things I want to talk about here. So the first is how do you deal with hate cards, what hard we're caring about, and corner cases versus common cases. So what I mean by these is sometimes someone might play a hate card that is extremely rare and kind of out of the ordinary, and it might get you, right? Sometimes that happens. If it's not a common occurrence, you shouldn't care about it. My point of view when I'm working on a combo net, especially when it comes to these builds, is how do we figure out if we care about something versus we don't care about it? Originally, we were playing eight painters because one of the concerns was our opponent might kill all our guys and then we can't win. But we quickly found out that if you're going off very fast and you're drawing a ton of cards, that's not something to worry about. That is a corner case. That is not a common enough case to really worry about. The other issue was that sometimes people would play cards like Weather the Storm and Prismatic Strands, and there were a lot of different corner cases that were kind of starting to become common enough. They were worth worrying about, and so how we dealt with that was Felden's Pain. It was really useful because it hit all of these issues at once. If your opponent with Manic Strands will turn you off, you can just put your net back in your library and then go off again and heal them the following turn. You know, in Life with one of the Storm, you can loop the net again and then just heal them with Bells uh, the following turn. And if they heal all your guys, you can loop your net back and replay them all. And while these are all fringe cases, if you're able to deal with all of them with just one card, I think to me that was worth it. But if something is just a fringe case, and you'd have to dedicate a separate card to all of them, that's something where it might not be worth considering, right? So you do want your net to be resilient, right? If your opponent does have interaction, you do have to think about how resilient am I am to interaction and how do I deal with forms of interaction. But at the same time, you do have to also consider if something is even worth caring about. Is it a corner case? Is it a common case? You just have to kind of feel it out. But that is something to keep in mind when it comes to net building. And it certainly came up when we were working on this form yet. The next thing I want to talk about is how compact is your win condition? If you look at the first build I had, uh, we were playing cards like First Day of Class. I am actually playing cards like Hanulfa Rebirth, Pass Summoning, Teach My Example. We had a lot of cards that were part of the combo. And the problem with them is that not all of these were useful outside of the combo, right? Uh, first day of class would technically become a preordain if you needed it to. Uh, teach by example, it would copy like a Knight's Whisper or like something of that nature. So those were not necessarily dead. However, it put up a lot of slots and they were slots that could have been other cards. And 
because you're painting up so many slots, they're not very compact, and they leave you less room for things that can help you find you have more to set it up. And so that's the general idea of compactness. And if you look at this, you can kind of go from left to right. It became more compact uh, after kind of tinkered with it, right? And and that's really important when it comes to that building, is you want to try and have your hobby be as compact as possible, because not every game are you going to get your hobby together immediately. You're going to have to use some hard selection, some hard filtration to find what you need. And uh, that's a really important balance, and Castle Flame Beat there was definitely a home run in, in that regard. And then the last thing here that I want to talk about when it comes to depth building is this idea of bricks. Uh, what do I mean when I talk about bricks? Well, let's kind of go into detail. So there's this idea of how fluid is your deck. Now, I've never heard anyone use this term before, but this is how I think about it, is when you're working on a deck, right, there are going to be cards in your deck that do absolutely nothing until the combo turn. In our deck, it is the four flame breathers and the one of Feldon's aim. So that's five bricks in total. But everything else either generates mana, which we kind of need to do, or it draws cards, which we kind of need to do. Or it's Yalvada Reeler, which is the best card in, you, in your deck. If you would have a lot of things in your deck that just find you more things to do, that's a very fluid deck. A really insane analogy is if I had a deck that would play like, say, 30 Black Lotuses, and like, 25 Ancestral Recalls, and then I have like, I don't know, like a Fireball or something. That would be a very fluid deck, and you would probably kill your opponent on turn 1 every time, because you're gonna just play Black Lotus, Ancestral, 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 and just, you know, draw your entire deck, right? And then you're gonna Fireball your opponent and win, right? Or you can have like, Fastest World, right? That's probably even better than a Fireball. What a break means is it doesn't hard that does absolutely nothing until the combo turn. I would say a really good example of this would be Sneak and Show in Legacy. So the idea is you're playing cards like Sneak Attack and Show and Tell to cheat out an Emerald Hole. Let's say I have a Show and Tell and an Emerald Hole. Together, they're really, really good. They do something powerful. On their own, they are a brick. They do not do anything. And so it's this issue of I have an A plus a B, but what if I have instead an A plus a C, right? So I have a Show and Tell and a Sneak Attack. Well, it's not really good if I don't have an Emerald Hole or a Rizzle Brain, right? What if I just have a Show and Tell does that do anything on its own? No, it doesn't. And and that's a brick. And so the idea behind all of this is that you want to reduce the amount of bricks in your deck when possible. Another really good analogy in Popper that you might be familiar with is Tireless Tribe Combo. You were trying to assemble Tireless Tribe plus Shadow Rift plus Inside Out and then have cards in your hand to discard to kill your opponent. That deck was very, very fluid because if you drew multiple copies of Inside Out, you could always cycle them. Right? If you do multiple copies of Shadow Rift, you can always cycle them. If you had copies of Yash, I mean, it, it just drew two cards, right? So most of your combo pieces were fluid. They can replace themselves. And uh, unfortunately, Emerald Hull and, and Show and Tell cannot do that. So if you have a handful of monsters, you have like three Emerald Hulls in your hand, it feels pretty bad because they don't do anything. And when you're building any combo deck, you want to always reduce the number of bricks when it is possible. And so this is always something that I look out for when I'm building a combo deck. And it's also something to keep in mind as to figure out how many pieces are needed to combo, right? It could be an A plus a B, but it could also be like an A plus a B plus a C, or an A plus a B plus a C plus a D, whatever, you know, however, however many pieces are needed. And the higher that number is, I would say the less efficient and viable that combo ha happens to be. And unless these bricks happen to just be good on their own, which in that case, it's good, I wouldn't consider it a brick. So if it was like a shadow if you can cycle it, it's not the worst thing. But if that's not the case, then it's something to pay attention to, and you always want to minimize that when possible. With all that being said, I think that I've kind of illustrated the history that went into building this deck, getting it from the very early iterations to where it is now. With that being said, where is Storm headed? Well, currently, I think it's a very good deck. I think people will eventually pick it up and do well in challenges with it, and I think it's here to say, I think we accomplished what we set out to do. And, uh... I'm really, really happy with the results, and I think it's going to continue to be a player in this meta game. The follow up question is where is Popper headed? These new sets that we have gotten recently for Popper have been insane. Popper has gotten extremely efficient. The hard draw is very, very fast and cheap, and the engines are just insane. I think right now the best decks in the format are Fairies, Affinity, Storm, and the more of decks. In no particular order, I think those are just probably what you should be playing. I think they're all very well suited, and uh, I'm, I'm interested to see where the meta game goes. I'm going to probably be playing Storm, and uh, I'll be making a video 
for it in the future, so keep an eye out for that. I'm really, really excited to see where Swarm goes, and I know there's a lot more, more eyes on it now, and uh, yeah, that's really, really sweet. So I hope you kind of enjoyed seeing the behind the scenes, as well as the various ideas that we, that, that, you know, I think of when building uh, any sort of combat. net. So yeah, that's that. That's all I have to say. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.